coolest technology floating around in biotech today. Essentially what we can now do is reprogram a patient's own immune system to go and find cancer. Hello, and welcome to the Market Bull Podcast. Please note, topics and stocks discussed in this podcast are not financial or investment advice. Dr. Tim Oldham is the CEO and Managing Director of AdAlta, listed on the ASX under code 1AD. AdAlta is a clinical stage biotechnology company developing a range of new drug treatments. Tim talked about the history of the company and what iBodies are and the platform they use. He also explained in depth AD214 and the drug application it has for a range of fibrosis treatments such as lungs, liver, eyes and kidney. AdAlta is also developing the CAR-T treatment with Kareem Biotech, which could revolutionize cancer tumor treatment. Here is Tim Oldham. So hello, I'm Ben Kostrich and this is the Market Bull Podcast. Joining me on the show today is Dr. Tim Oldham, the CEO and Managing Director of AdAlta, which is listed on the ASX under code 1AD. Uh, it's a clinical stage biotechnology company focused on drug development for an array of different aspects. Uh, and I won't pronounce myself as an expert. That's why Tim is going to be here breaking down a lot of the points that the company is doing. But welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks, Ben, for having me. Delighted to be here. So we'll go a lot more into the depth and the nitty gritties of, of what the company is achieving and what it's setting out to do. But before we dive into that, I always like to introduce the guests themselves and, and a bit about their history. So for those that are potentially unfamiliar with, with who you are and what you've done previously, I mean, what is your history and how has it led you to the position you are now, which I think you joined back in 2019? But yeah, what, what is your history? Yeah, I guess it's a long way from, you know, a country lad in country New South Wales growing up on a farm to you know, leading an ASX listed biotech company. Um, I guess the journey's always been, I've been interested in the intersection of science and business. I'm a great subscriber to the idea that innovation is only innovation when you invent something that someone's willing to pay for. And so that intersection between invention and commercialization has really been focused for me. Um, uh, I studied science and law at ANU in Canberra. I was lucky enough to get a, to do a PhD uh, at Imperial College in London. Um, uh, then joined McKinsey and Company as a management consultant for four or five years and sort of did a world MBA, if you like. And so for the last 20 years then in the pharmaceutical industry, in, in mid-tier multinational pharma companies, uh, and then more recently in, in smaller startup innovative biotech companies, but it's all been in the innovative high growth divisions of those companies. So uh, started out with main pharmaceuticals as it then was, uh, one of the world's leading generic oncology companies. We were making um, uh, cost-effective uh, copies, I guess, of the, many of the chemotherapy drugs that are mainstays of chemo regimes today. I worked in the European business, which was the fastest growing part of that business uh, for four or five years in business development, strategic marketing, um, uh, did the first deal to get main pharmaceuticals into uh, the field of biosimilars as, as it then was. Um, so they were the first time we ever thought about generic generics of biotechnology drugs. Um, uh, memorable experience then was actually negotiating how we named these things at the World Health Organization in Geneva, um, which was a, a pretty cool experience. But um, I worked across 15 countries in Europe, uh, spent a fair chunk of time commuting to India during that time as well. They came back to Australia and ran commercial operations for Hospira, which was a US-based um, injectable generic company. Um, so it was a $300 million business, 400 employees across the region, um, really a key growth area for Hospira because we were underweight in terms of the total market potential. So spent a lot of time growing our Japanese business. Um, we had about 25% growth there over a four year period every year, uh, opened offices in Korea and Shanghai, um, was part of a team that conceived of and designed the first ever low cost and management pump for the Chinese market. They love IVs there, but they're mm. gravity controlled and we needed a safer way to do it. So there was this track record, I guess, of I really loved these innovative um, high growth areas. How do you drive growth and innovation? Um, and so when I left Hospira, it was, you know, the, it was time to try my hand at the really innovative space. Um, and then I became CEO of a company called Cell Therapy, which was a contract manufacturer of cell and gene therapies. So I see some of the most advanced 
technologies that are being deployed in, in pharmaceuticals today. And we'll talk more about CAR T cells later on. Um, but I ran that contract manufacturing business as a subsidiary of the cancer center for four years. Um, you know, again, we achieved around 30% growth in revenue over that time period, moved to a facility, worked on some of the most innovative drugs um, on the planet, um, helped treat some of the first ever patients in Australia to receive these really incredible therapies. Um, and then after a couple of um, startup attempts, um, a daughter opportunity arose in late 2019. Um, and, and for me, this was an opportunity to sort of bring a lot of the pieces that I'd done before. And really, I think the vision for me personally was here's an opportunity to kind of do tech properly in Australia. This was a company that had um, a, a platform technology that was capable of reproducing multiple products over time. It wasn't a single product company. It wasn't in finance and built to build an asset that was going to be sold to someone else. It was built to create multiple drugs over time and create you know, sustainable employment for our scientists. We're one of the few tech companies that actually employs our own wet scientists in Australia. Um, uh, and so that was the opportunity that I saw at Dalter and, and why I ended up here. So I guess it's a consistent journey of, of innovation and trying to link the amazing inventions of our biotechnologists around the world into products that will ultimately benefit patients. It's the governing theme. Yeah, well, from the sounds of that, and you you sort of encapsulated your entire time quite quickly, but it sounded like you were, again, all over the world working in all different aspects. And this is now, yeah, the culmination of, as you've touched on, the drivers for yourself personally, which is, you know, again, you can say why people take on the positions they do. It's because of more of a, a personal driver and, and the opportunity they can see with it. But you, you mentioned a little bit there about what Adalta is doing with the drug development. Um, and for those that are not familiar with what the company even is, for example, I mean, when you're talking about these drug development technologies and what the company is, I mean, how do you describe it for people that have never come across the company before? So Adalta's mission in life really is to go where anybody drugs cannot. We've got a really powerful drug discovery platform, which we call our iBodies. We think this is ideally suited to addressing those diseases that uh, traditional antibody drugs have struggled with. Um, so let's unpack that a little bit more. Mm, so please, yeah. Antibody drugs, um, they, these are really large molecules. Our, our immune system functions on uh, using these molecules called antibodies. Uh, if you think about aspirin as the drug we all know and familiar with treating headaches, well, these molecules are thousands of times larger than aspirin. Um, they're really very complex structures, but what they are is able to very specifically target individual, what we call drug targets or receptors in the body um, with a high degree of selectivity and specificity. The problems with a drug like aspirin, less so with aspirin, but many other small molecules, is that they bind to their target pretty well, but they also bind to other things. And many of the side effects you see with small molecule drugs um, a result of them binding to things they shouldn't, but we don't mm. like them. So anybody drugs, when we finally found out uh, the, the tools the immune system had given us and asked those to create novel new antibodies against targets that didn't appear in your, to your immune system traditionally, that unlocked a whole new way of targeting um, uh, disease. And the antibody drugs revolutionized our pharmaceutical arsenal 30 years ago when they first appeared. But it became apparent really, really quickly that these large, complex antibody molecules couldn't do everything. And almost from day one, the search has been on for smaller uh, antibody-like molecules that are capable of delivering that antibody-like selective specificity. Um, uh, without the same size and complexity. And they can almost form Lego bricks if you like to build multiple different drug formats and drug constructs that can solve all of those problems where a traditional antibody is either too big or simply can't get to and engage the sort of targets we now need to address. Um, so Adultus Technology, we call it our iPhone platform, uh, is a really powerful drug discovery tool that can solve many of those um, challenges we believe that traditional antibodies can't. Interesting. And and the iBody, uh, I mean, this technology that Adalta has, 
I, I mean, it's it's probably quite easy. Well, no, I shouldn't say quite easy, but but I mean, describing that and even the process of developing that. I mean, for those that are trying to understand what makes this so unique and, and how it can be applied. I mean, how do you describe what the what the eye body is? So the eye body is a really tiny. Think of it as a really tiny antibody. It's about a tenth of the size of a traditional monoclonal antibody. Uh, it's a human protein that mimics these really tiny antibody features that are found in the shark immune system. Now, when we discovered that we needed something smaller than traditional antibodies, people started searching for something in nature that might fit the bill. Um, and interestingly, we discovered that um, independently, camels, llamas, and alpacas, that camelid family, Mm. And sharks have developed what we call these single domain antibodies, the really tiny antibody molecules. Um, well, what the, the invention that underpins the daughter's existence was the discovery of a human protein that looked very, very similar to this shark single domain antibody system. And we were able to then use biotechnology techniques to engineer in the binding domains that we needed to enable us to create a mimic of this shark single domain antibody system. So we have a fully human protein that mimics an antibody-like structure that's found in nature that has all those tiny size features that we were looking for to do what traditional monoclonal antibodies can't. Interesting. Okay. I, I like I like finding out how it happens because naturally developing these new drug technologies, uh, yeah, you have to think a little bit outside the box and I think for for a lot of us, it's sort of realm, going into a realm where people just sort of stand back and go, oh, it's not not my section. I don't, I don't really want to know about it. It's, it's like leave it up to the experts, the doctors, the scientists. But uh, I mean, if we're, we're jumping across to the one of the key pillars of the company, which is the the eighty two one four. Um, I mean, that's I see a lot of the communication about that, and you've got a few others. But w what is eighty two one four? So eighty two one four is the first drug product we've discovered and developed using the iBody platform. So think of the iBodies, if you draw the analogy with computer chips, the iBody is like the Intel computer chip that's inside your PC. Mm. 82 and 4 is the first PC that we created. Um, and the way we use the iBody in 8214 is the iBody binds to a particular drug target, a, a receptor on the surface of, of cells that we know is involved in a range of diseases called broadly fibrosis. So this is mm. the gathering of an internal organ. So in this particular instance, we're using the eye body um, to block that receptor so that it shuts down the processes that are causing fibrosis and scarring and therefore damage to um, organs, a variety of different organs. Mm. Um, uh, it's just one exemplar of the way we can conduct drugs with the, with the eye body technology. So we're treating a disease called fibrosis or a family of diseases called fibrosis. Um, 8214 um, is what we call a first-in-class molecule. So it's the first drug to be targeting this particular pathway in fibrosis. Um, and one of the reasons is we've never been able to find an easy way to target this particular receptor with antibody-like precision before. Um, and all the small molecules that have targeted this receptor have toxic side effects that, that cause heart disease and those sorts of things when you use mm. them over a long period of time, which is what you need to do for fibrosis. So we're a filling class molecule. Fibrosis is scarring of an internal organ. So you know when you cut yourself, uh, a scar forms and what are the implications of that? Your skin stiffens and, and it will pucker and, and wrinkle. Mm. Now, you can imagine if that process happens in your lung, which is supposed to be expanding and contracting every second of your life, and so they lose that elasticity, that's gotten pretty major consequences on your ability to breathe. Mm. So one of the fibrotic diseases, in fact, the lead one we're working on is a disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a long-handed way of saying scarring of the lungs and we don't know what causes it. Yeah. This is an orphan disease. It affects about half a million people around the world a year. Um, no known cause, no cure, two marketed drugs today that don't work particularly well and have some pretty horrendous side effects. And 50% of patients die within four years of diagnosis and they'll do, die because they can no longer breathe. Mm, so this is devastating. Um, so this is just one example, but we're scarring in almost every organ system of the body. 
uh, 45% of human deaths are believed to be due to organ failure in the fibrotic component. So if you've got chronic kidney disease, you've either got diabetes or renal failure or something like that, you'll be getting scar scarring is a natural wound healing procedure. But if that is ongoing and chronic, it destroys the tissues, tissue structure. It can happen in your eyes. You get leaky blood vessels in the back of your eyes. Very well controlled by some really good drugs today, the $16 billion market there. But they don't last forever. And when they fail, mm. you end up with scarring. And that's the major cause of blindness in Western markets today. Um, so you can see that, you know, across lungs, kidney, and eye, which are the main areas we've been working, um, you know, there is a, a continuing unmet need for a disease or a condition that they don't understand how to control very well today. And so there's a deep need for new therapies. Um, in the field of lung fibrosis, for example, you know, there are a number of drugs in development already. Um, when 82 and 4 go to phase two clinical trials, which we hope will happen in the relatively near future, um, it will be only one of three drugs that are targeting a genuinely new pathway for addressing this disease. And the only one that's doing it with antibody like precision and specificity. Mm. Um, the other drugs are a small molecule. Um, so we think that's a you know, really strong competitive position for this molecule in that particular indication. Yeah, because, I mean, it goes without saying, I think a lot of people are probably thinking about their lungs given uh, the, the pandemic and everything that we went through and some of the ongoing implications of that. And I think it's almost, uh, uh, you could say it's, you know, a, a no-brainer that the, there's going to be so, some ongoing um, difficulties with, with breathing and this uh, potential uh, drug is is going to be in the long term quite beneficial for people and, and understanding that yeah like uh, the idea that you're, you're breathing and you know your lungs are, your lungs are damaged um eventually it's going to have massive implications on you and i think everyone's so much more attuned to to their own health and what they can do but if you're, you're diving through you just said that the next stage of the, the, the clinical trials i can imagine that there's been a fair bit of research or even even trying to understand which potential parts of, of fibrosis to, to target. And, and you said, yeah, the heart, the eyes and, and liver are the, the primary ones, but it almost afflicts all aspects of the human body. But if we're focusing on, on the, the lungs as the, the foremost one, I mean, what, what are you guys doing to, I guess, progress that drug um, with, with clinical studies, with partners, um, negotiations with, you know, I guess the, the authorities and, and the leading, uh, I guess, drug bodies or groups that say yes or no to certain um, new new medications comes online. But what are those sorts of processes like? Yeah, well, that's a pretty uh, wide-ranging question there. <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can address some of those and mm. pick me up on the ones we missed. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of 8214 first. And, and it's probably valuable for people to realize just how long this process actually takes. Mm. So we started work on what is now 8214 in 2016. Um, we, over the next five years, did a lot of work on uh, proving that it worked in uh, animal models, um, understanding how it worked in, in what we call in vitro models, so with tubes and petri dishes in a lab, um, developing a manufacturing process that could scale and would be sufficiently controlled to be safe enough to put, produce drugs for a patient, it's super highly regulated. Um, and we eventually had that complete and did the first patients in a phase one clinical trial in 2020, 2021. Um, so it took us five years to get to the start of the clinical development program. Mm. Um, uh, our job as a company really is to develop drugs to you know, really uh, late preclinical, what we call preclinical proof of concept. So we've, we've treated animals and relevant animal models and demonstrated that the drug works. Um, and early clinical. So phase one, which is designed to test safety, um, possibly phase two. And it's one of the reasons why we told lung, chose lung fibrosis is because it's a relatively clean, straightforward pathway into phase two. Um, uh, we are probably a year or two years away from phase two now. Um, uh, and so you know, we're really, you know, again, emphasizing that it's a really long journey. Where, where mm. we, yeah, sort of by the time we get to phase two, it'll be nine years since we started development. And we're probably still six or seven years away from the drug hitting the market. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't generate value and realize the value of the investment we've made so far. So we estimate we've, we've probably invested somewhere between 25 and $30 million in this drug so far. 
Um, we completed our actual phase one study. We got to the end of that. And we knew it worked in animal studies. We knew it was safe or well tolerated in humans. Um, we knew that uh, we had we understood the distribution of the drug in in the human body and how long it was able to block its target receptors. What we didn't know was whether we could connect that distribution receptor or occupancy profile with efficacy in a way that would be convenient for a clinician or patient to use. Mm. So we know that if we're going to ask a patient, this drug at the moment is given intravenously um, by infusions. That means I've got to go into a hospital or a doctor clinic in order to get the drug. We know they're not going to do that more than once every three weeks and ideally longer than, between infusions than that. So is our drug going to be efficacious over that two-week period? Are there other routes of administration we could give that will be more convenient for a patient so they don't come into hospital, for example? So we spent a lot of work between the end of the last phase one study and, and getting ready for our phase two study, um, focused on trying to answer the question. And in the last uh, three months, we've been able to make some really significant progress addressing that question. We've been able to show that um, we understand the level of receptor occupancy now that's necessary to meaningfully inhibit the necrotic processes. And we've been able to run some simulations that show that we can maintain that level of receptor occupancy for that two week minimum window we need at a dose that we think is commercially viable. So there's a huge de-risking step that we've been mm. able to achieve in the last couple of months. And then on top of that, we've been able to use the same model to simulate the performance of the drug to actually suggest that we might be able to administer the drug subcutaneously. So this is on skin. Mm. This is what diabetics do every day of their lives with insulin. So it's you know, pretty familiar, um, and that can be done daily, weekly, and possibly we could even do that and reduce the dose even further. Now, there's a lot of work to go to develop mm. that population up, but that opportunity just adds even more value to the program because now we've got a pathway to an even more convenient formulation at a lower cost of goods, and that's really significant for the commercial partners that we would work with to help progress it through to phase two and phase three. Mm. Well, I think that was the, the last bit there that we could sort of explore a bit more, but is naturally the, the commercial partners and even the, the researchers that have been a part of this and the, I guess, the strategic groups that are, that are alongside either investigating and doing the research and building this. Um, and if it's just primarily focused on 8214, because I know there's uh, the, the other the other parts that we'll talk about in a second, but I mean, what are some of the, I guess, groups that you're working alongside with to really develop these um these like, yeah, drugs and, and customizable eye body. Yeah. So key in the early days was working with um, uh, clinicians and clinician researchers who understood fibrosis. They were working with it all the time and, and really trying to get them to help us unpick whether the method of approaching fibrosis made sense and to demonstrate that it worked. Um, and so we were able to work with some of the leading um, lung fibrosis researchers around the world, starting with um, a group here in Melbourne at the Alfred Hospital who were able to show that, yes, our, the receptor we're targeting is upregulated in multiple different cell types in lung fibrosis. Um, uh, we were able to work with uh, a group at the University of Melbourne to evaluate the drug in eye fibrosis. Uh, we were able to work with a group at the University of Sydney to test it in kidney fibrosis. Uh, and we were able to work with a group at the Cedar sinai Medical Centre um, in Los Angeles and another group at the Fraunhofer Institute in Munich to test that the drug worked in in, in vitro models of fibrosis. Um, and indeed, you know, one of those researchers um, at Cedar sinai said he'd never seen anything performed by this in his assay. Mm. So that was something that gave us enormous confidence. Um, so that was a key starting point for this. We've got something here, de-risk, that gave us confidence that this is worth investing now the money to build manufacturing processes and do all the... Um, toxicology studies to demonstrate in animals that it's safe. So then we worked with a group called KBI Biopharmaceuticals in North Carolina in the US. These are a contract manufacturer of biologic drugs. They're used to making this type of molecule. Uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration approved mm -hmm. uh, other products. So we knew that they could develop a manufacturing process that was going to be uh, able to be accepted by the, the regulators. Uh, and we've been working with them now since 2018-ish. Um, uh, so they're a key part of our, I guess, side chain for clinical and ultimately commercial. Um, and then we work with um, toxicology and regulatory firms out of Canada to provide us with access to the uh, 
uh, toxicology models and regulatory interactions with the uh, with the North American agencies. Um, so they're probably the key groups that we worked with for AD two one four specifically. Hmm. Um, going forward, um, yes, we've spent as I said twenty five to thirty million today. Uh, we did the same again to run the phase two study. Um, and so that's something that we're really, given our business model, we don't really want to ask our shareholders directly to fund. Um, so we've got two strategies to help us fund phase two. Um, one is to partner the asset now with large pharmaceutical companies, and there is an active market there uh, for drugs at this stage of development in lung fibrosis. Uh, and the alternative is to um, essentially project finance it, so to take investment directly into the asset itself rather than the company. Mm. Uh, to progress the model forward through phase two clinical trials before we then license it at a significant, obviously, value uplift once we get through phase two. Interesting. Um, uh, yeah. Because um, I, I think for, for a lot of a lot of people, uh, almost the, the long lasting time that it takes to develop these drugs, it's all about, from an investment point of view, keeping them interested in, in almost a, right. a, a sad sense because it's it takes so long to develop these these medications doesn't happen overnight. Um, and if you're a similar, uh, like mindset towards mining, um, it, it's sort of, there's a little bit more news, but it's sort of hard to see, um, I guess with, with a lot of these biotech companies and at Alta, for example, there's so much stuff that's happening. It's just almost an extended timeline, but the upside and the addressable market is massive. And I, I think you talked a little bit there about the, the molecule, the, the or macula, sorry, uh, which is focused on the eyes. Um, I just like a little bit, a lo little bit more about, Again, really the addressable market for 8214. And I love the idea that from the outset, you said a lot of these technologies or these drugs that you're developing are customizable, um, which not saying that you can just change it on a dime, but there's a lot of uh, opportunity to really address these markets as or these these illnesses as they sort of emerge more rapidly. Um, but if you're focusing on the eye and on almost the affliction that that has, uh, I mean, what is really the addressable market for for that in particular? Yeah. So maybe I'll come at it at a slightly different angle. So, so 8214 is one example of using the eye body technology. Mm. 8214 has potential multiple different indications. And this is one of the things we, we evaluate when we're selecting yeah. drugs, develop drugs against, you know, is it going to be used in multiple different ways? So lung fibrosis is the start. It's the easiest to prove um, uh, that it works quickly as the fastest and probably the cheapest to do that. That's a $4.3 billion market today with those two drugs that don't work particularly well. Um, in kidney fibrosis, that market is estimated to be worth about $10 billion a year uh, in terms of a total addressable market. Um, and in eye fibrosis, that's a $16 billion a year market. Yeah. Uh, there are also yes. possible applications to the drug in cancer. We have a collaboration to the Korean company to explore those. Uh, they're a billion dollar market for each different type of cancer that you might uh, might address. So, yes, these are massive markets. Um, those massive markets are are essential in order to justify the cost of development that um, these drugs have to go through. Uh, but equally, it illustrates the potential additive value of those subsequent indications. But we focus very much on the lung fibrosis indication right now. Yeah, you know, that alone's a Four point three billion dollar a year potential market, likely to be five billion by twenty thirty, um, and, and likely to be a market where combination therapies become the norm rather than single agent therapies, um, and that further accelerates the, the market because you you can have you know, the, the market share of each individual drug can add up to more than one hundred percent because they're used together. And mm. That's another benefit of a of a first-in-class molecule like ours, it's it's not competing with another molecule in the same class, which you can use together, but it can be used with all the other drugs that are in development. Um, the other piece about the value is, okay, that's $4.3 billion market, $5 billion by 2030 when this might come to market. That's a long way away. Our business model doesn't rely on us waiting till revenue arrives. Our business model is about realizing that value through licensing partnerships and attracting external investment into the individual programs mm. much earlier. Uh, and so in that sense, it is a bit like mine. You know, your, your, your geologist goes and prospects and discovers signs in a particular tenement, pays mm. the tenement, gets the license to that particular tenement, and then sells it to someone. They're not sitting there waiting for the tens of billions of dollars of investment to build a new lithium mine or a new nickel yeah. mine. 
right? They sell it to someone else who then goes and drills the boreholes, then goes and sells it to someone else who actually starts the actual heavy investment in mining. So the same model works for drug development. You have a lot of smaller companies like your academic institutions that discover drug targets and pathways. You have small companies, drug discovery companies like Adult who develop those to initial proof of concept. You have other companies that take those on mm. and develop them through phase two. And then you hand it on to the big pharma companies who develop it to phase three and commercialization. I appreciate that analogy because I think the knowing that a lot of the companies that I've spoken with, it's all the mining space, it's good to draw those parallels so people can start understanding a bit more because you almost assume that there, there is a lot of pharmaceutical and biotech in Australia, but a lot of people just instantly think of the US uh, and, and drug development companies there. And, and yet, you know, the FDA is the main, I guess, uh, the gate of what people are trying to accomplish and get through. And there's almost this, yeah, when you start speaking about biotech in Australia, there are some great companies and there's some great um, standards, but it's almost like this bias that we have, we just instantly think of the US, uh, at least that's from for my, my own footsteps. But I mean, the, the other interesting point, um, and this is more so from some of the presentations that I've watched and, and also on the website, but is the, the CAR-T um, mm. and the, the cancer sort of focus there. I mean, I, I sort of jumped out of that as being like, oh, that's another quite a, you know, you've got such a great product happening with the, the AD214 and then you've also got this. I was like, well, that's a another great, you know, Sign, sign for the company, but for those that, well, even for me, I mean, what is the, the car T and, and what is that, that program? Yeah. So this is, I mean, I've been working in the cellular immunotherapy space of which car T is a part since about 2012, 2013. Um, I think this is some of the coolest technology floating around in biotech today. Mm. Essentially what we can now do is reprogram a patient's own immune system to go and find cancer. So remember that cancer is your own cells that have gone rogue. Mm. And therefore they hide from your immune system, right? Because otherwise your immune system would attack yourself. Yeah. Right. Um, and so the discovery that we could harness your own immune system essentially by genetically modifying it to put a a GPS tracker, if you like, on it, so that now it can go and find cancer, and then the the immune cell is now capable of killing doing its normal job and killing the cancer. Mm. It's just mind blowing. The benefit of these drugs is that it's a one dose that's potentially curative and potentially lasts forever. Cheers. Because once you've modified the patient's immune system, that goes into your immune repertoire and is always there. So if the cancer ever comes back. Your immune system is already primed to say, oh, it's I'm registered. We're mm. out of here. Mm. Um, so that's super cool. And, and the outcomes have been nothing short of phenomenal. So think of the, the evolution of cancer care has gone from surgery, we cut it out, to chemotherapy, which essentially is poisoning the cancer slightly faster than we pull it the patient. Mm. It's on specific, it's killing high proliferating cells, which cancer are. Um, but it was pretty crude. We then went on to um, antibodies and, and immunotherapies, which are called targeted therapies. And these were now able to target specific features on cancers that were unique to the cancers. And there are some of those markers, uh, but you have to keep giving them to keep killing. And they, they still have to recruit the immune system in order to kill the cancer. Uh, they've gone so far, but they only have limited effects. So when CAR T cells were first given to um, patients, uh, first two patients were treated in 2012, I think it was. Um, uh, the first child was treated, had, she had leukemia. She was about five, I think, um, five or six. She'd failed about six lines of chemotherapy already. Her parents had been told. It's nothing, nothing, nothing else. Left. No. We haven't got anything left we can do. Except for this, she got one dose of her own immune cells that had been taken from her body, genetically engineered in the lab, given back to her. She celebrated 12 years cancer free last night. All right. All right. We're getting 90% complete response rates with this therapy in kids. We're getting 65% complete response rates for the same kind of therapy in adults with blood cancers. Uh, these are unheard of for patients who failed. Mm. 
Um, so although these therapies are really expensive, they're really patient specific. I can only, at the moment, I can only use your immune cells for you. Mm. If I give you my immune cells, it's not going to work. Will attack everything in your body, or your residual immune system will take mm. out your immune cells and just donate it. Um, so they're really, really expensive. It's four hundred and something thousand dollars US a dollar, but you only mm. need one and it lasts forever. Yeah, I mean so that's just is, mind blowing. This is, this is yeah. mind blowing technology. So, so what does that mean for adulta? The threat now is we've had these great successes in solid cancers, in blood cancers, right? That's 10% of all cancers. The main game is how do we bring that same level of hope to solid tumors? Solid tumors are much harder to target. They're much harder for your immune system to actually infiltrate. And so the concept of where we need to take CAR T cell therapies for solid tumors is what I like to call multifunctional CAR T cells. So not only are we putting a GPS tracker on them, we may be putting two trackers on them because these solid tumors have, aren't all the same cells. Mm. And so we might need two different um, trackers in order to hit all the tumors in the tumor. Uh, we also know that the tumor is suppressive. So we actually need to armor the immune system with its own protection against the immune suppression that the tumor is accreting. Right. Now, that requires much more engineering of the cell. Mm. The problem is that you can only insert so much genetic material into the cell with current technology. So there's a limit of how many functions that you can put into the immune cell. Rolling eye bodies, which are half the size of the traditional modules we use, and suddenly you've doubled your payload. Uh. Right. So the advantage of the eye bodies is the small size plus the unique targets that we can hit, meaning that we can create these multifunctional, multi-targeting, 2 gps tracker immune cells with the same size of genetic payload as required to develop a single monotarget of T-cell today. And there's probably also room to add an armoring component. Jeez. So we're opening up, and our vision in life in the CAR-T space is to open up the field of solid tumors to CAR T cell therapy. And all we're, we're providing Lego blocks to it, right? We work at the moment, we work with other companies um, who have the, the cellular engineering piece to create the cell. And we provide the Lego blocks that provide the targeting and the armoring. And that's the essence of our collaboration with Karina Biotech. Mm. I have a world-class cell therapy platform to manufacture these immune, cell, immune cells. What they lacked was the ability to target them. They were reliant on in-licensing binder or a, a GPS tracking module from other companies. Um, and they really didn't get a chance to optimize that. It's really important that you are able to choose that GPS tracker so that it actually has the right characteristics. Many companies today, particularly academic institutions, just pull one off the top and they haven't optimized that. We now know it's really important to optimize that GPS tracker component. So the power mm. of putting a daughter and Karina together is that we now have the engineering to complete development of a completely optimized CAR T system. Uh, there's, there, to my knowledge, there isn't another company in Australia can actually do that today. So in the list space, they're all reliant on in-licensing um, uh, products that are being developed by others. And so they take proof of concept and develop it through clinical. Perfectly acceptable business model, mm. but they don't have our difference, our, our difference, if you like, is that ability to engineer and optimize a T cell from scratch. Jeez, I mean that's, oh, yeah, that's um, that's it's incredible to think about from a, a I mean, an application to to humans and to every day, and this is from the outset the the customizableness uh, a lot of what Adalta is is achieving, and this just sounds like a. Well, yeah, I can see why you said it's quite exciting because this is sort of revolutionary technology uh, and drugs in regards to yeah helping people and, and having a, a potential better outlook for for cancer patients. And we know how many that afflicts, and I don't think the the stats are really dropping. And and it, it's good to see that this is you now this is how we progress as you know a people, <laughs> but as as a, a world. I mean, that's just yeah, I'm kind of just taken aback by the yeah the the applications of it and just the the thought of it.
Yeah, and we think this is an area where it really showcases all of the features of an iBody, differentiated features of an iBody in one package. Um, uh, and I talk about our iBodies in this space as being um, potentially catalog molecules. So if you think about them like a Lego brick, we've, we're producing a red or green or a yellow Lego brick, many different ways and different structures you can build mm. with those individual bricks. So we can potentially, if we get it right, and we're working on the, the next generation of our iBody targeting uh, Moedi today, um, we get it right, they could be used in multiple different car feed products. So one discovery program on our part could be used in multiple products with multiple different partners um, down the track. And so I think it's a really exciting way of uh, turbocharging the impact of our, our iBody discovery platform really quickly in a way that showcases all, all the unique features of the platform. Mm. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, that, the point of difference there and the uniqueness of it really just jumps out. Uh, well, yeah, definitely at me. And I, I can see why there's still such a focus from the company on, on that side of developing it. And as you said, it, it's a good sort of partnership to have um, in regards to getting it to those next stages and, and the uniqueness that the, the eye bodies present in doubling the the payload, arguably, like that's a, it's quite a unique point of difference for, for the company. And I mean, we've talked now really at length, but I can imagine that there's probably investors on the other side now just sort of wondering what what, what happens next in the long term for for the company. As we said, it's it's a long process. It's not going to be, yep. you know, in, in the next 12 months, arguably this is like a, you know, 15 year plan of bringing it. But for those that are potentially looking at what's going to happen and unfold over the next you know, 12 to 24 months. I mean, what can we really expect coming out from at Alto over, over the coming period of time? Yeah, the next 12 months uh, are, have got a lot happening for us. Um, let's talk about 8214 first. Mm -hmm. So back of that work we've done to to really confirm a our target product profile, if you like, is, is going to be efficacious, really important going to phase two. Um, in addition to doing all the work we need to do for preparing for phase two, uh, we're actually running an extension of our phase one clinical trial at the moment. Um, and that's designed to increase the maximum dose at which we have safety data to that 10 milligrams per kilogram, which simulations are telling us is the efficacious mm. dose. And that means that we're ready to go into phase two. We've got the safety profile nailed um, and that it will actually shorten the time that it's taken for our partners or our um, or, or our investors to phase two. Um, the results of that study are due out in November um, at a top so, line. Um, mm. So the top line um, uh, drug distribution and, and receptor occupancy data will have full safety data in Q1 next year. Um, we're also working hard, as I mentioned, to uh, work out how do we progress this into phase two without having to go back to shareholders and ask them for more money to do that. Um, mm. We're well advanced on both partnering conversations with large pharmaceutical companies and with um, um, project investors. Uh, and so I think there's an opportunity, um, and we're not forecasting when, but we're, we're certainly fairly increasingly confident around the possibility of a transaction involving 8214. Um, at some time in the not too distant future. And just by way of illustration, um, your licensing bills for assets in pulmonary fibrosis in the last 12 to 18 months, um, they're commanding upfront payments of $40 million US higher with contingent milestone payments, assuming that a continued success of mm. um, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. Okay. Right. Now, that up mm. payment is a significant multiple on our current market capitalization. Mm. So, massive upside potential. And it's that same value in that inherent value in that asset that we think is probably not fully reflected in our share price today. But even if we project finance this, it'll create visibility on what this asset is really worth. Interesting. So, yeah. on, the, on the 8214 slide, it's data on the phase one extension study. Um, and it's uh, potential transactions for in the next 12 month window with the data starting to flow from as early as November. Um, if you then look at the rest of our business, um, continuing with the business development campaign in, uh, in the CAR T space, um, uh, working with a number of potential partners there on providing our robotics technology into their 
platforms and we would expect to be able to release some results from our initial three programs that are running with Karina um, mm. the next months as well. So you'll see progress on the Karina front. Um, you'll see uh, and potential new transactions to add more Karina-like partners into the mix. We've also been pretty explicit that we're evaluating um, technologies that are complementary to the eye bodies that would help us build out our clinical stage pipeline. So the idea here is that we can potentially acquire or license at relatively low upfront cost clinical ready assets that build out our clinical stage pipeline because we know that investors value clinical stage readouts and that preclinical mm -hmm. is really hard to interpret. So the more clinical stage assets we have, the more um, regular news flow we can have with clinical results. And this is what I hark back to my earlier comment around AI technology properly. It's about mm. building things with meaningful pipelines, balanced pipelines across all stages of development. Uh, the beauty of doing this is that the technologies we're looking at ultimately be enhanced by the eye bodies down the track. So not only do they provide products in the clinic, they also provide us with opportunities to and additional platforms on to build eye body enabled products in the future. So um, we've deliberately been pretty tight lipped about what those transactions might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a pretty robust pipeline there. Where we've been obvious about our pipeline goes back to A214, where coming out of bio, we're the largest industry partnering conference every year, um, was in Boston this year in June. Uh, we had 21 companies that we believed at that point in time were actively evaluating AD214 for licensing before phase two. So we excluded everyone who was interested with phase two data. Mm. Uh, and uh, we were a list of about 21. Now that's obviously an evolving list. There's a few come on since then, a few dropped off since then. Yep. Um, about a third of those were already under confidentiality agreement and another third of them we'd already got through the initial commercial assessment and we we're talking directly to R&D teams, which is a big milestone forward mm -hmm. in negotiating with Big Pharma. So really robust pipeline. Again, and I can say there's a similar, similarly robust pipeline in, the, in that technology evaluation part. So the upshots, bring that all back together to your original question, what are people mm. looking for in the next 12 months? New clinical data on 8214 uh, in November and then in Q1 next year. Uh, uh, financing strategy for 8214 phase two either project financing or, or a licensing transaction um, and the possibility of transactions to add additional assets to our pipeline uh, that will ultimately strengthen our ability to deploy eye bodies into as many um, novel areas as possible. Fantastic. Well, it, it sounds like a lot's happening and I appreciate you synthesizing it at the end because I can imagine people would have just been zoned in on a few features there, but that was fantastic. And, and I know that there's going to be listeners uh, potentially that have, have been quite encapsulated by this this story uh, and what Adalta is doing. So for those that are trying to, I shouldn't say trying to, want to follow the story and, and keep up to date with everything that's happening, where, where can they go and how can they stay in contact with the company? Uh, so the easiest way to do it is to sign up to our email distribution list, which you can do at our website, uh, alter.com.au. Uh, and if you go to the, in the contact us page, there's a you can sign up to our email distribution list. Um, you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. We're pretty active on, on both of those. Um, and uh, inquiries at adulta.com.au will get an email um, directly to myself. But I think that was, uh, you, you really discussed everything I, I could have asked for. And, and I think it was, um, yeah, it was a very in-depth conversation. So I appreciate your time, Tim. And um, yeah, it, it's going to be an exciting period of time. Um, and I'm looking forward to following it and seeing how it goes and, and hopefully getting you back in the future to to see what, what's been happening, what's been unfolding and, and update listeners on, on what has really been accomplished by the company. But thank you so much, Tim. Thanks, Ben, for having me. Um, I can always talk about our company and, and what we're doing ad nauseum. So um, hopefully that's been helpful to your listeners. Thanks for listening to the Market Bull podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to like and subscribe. You can follow the Market Bull on our socials at Twitter and LinkedIn by searching the Market Bull. You can also subscribe to our newsletter on the website by visiting www.themarketbull.com.au.